consulting for them. So mesenteric arterial disease actually is a quite wide spectrum that goes from acute to chronic ischemia and involves more than one disease process. I want to try to focus today on chronic and acute mesenteric ischemia, and I'm not going to be really uh, going at length on issues such as dissection, median arcuate ligament syndrome, and aneurysms, but we can discuss that uh, later. I mean, intestinal angina is really the primary symptom of chronic mesenteric ischemia, and this uh, term was coined uh, in a landmark publication by Dunphy in 1936, where he described that most patients with gut infarction had a prodrome of abdominal pain and weight loss. And uh, for, for interest, for us uh, surgeons, uh, you know, the, the first paravisceral transaortic thromboendotraectomy was reported in 1958 by Shaw, Annard, and Rutledge. The issue with chronic mesenteric ischemia is that if left untreated, the disease progresses and eventually leads to acute on chronic ischemia with bowel infarction. And in fact, on this review by Mike Park of the Mayo Clinic experience, 65% of the patients with acute mesenteric ischemia had a history of recurrent abdominal pain and mortality on that cohort was 40%. Now, for the most part, mesenteric ischemia is caused by osteoatherosclerotic disease. This is uh, the disease we know that affects uh, the origin and branch vessels of the aorta, such as the renal artery, the mesenteric arteries, the supraaortic trunks. And you can see here quite characteristic uh, imaging of a patient with the classic atherosclerotic mesenteric ischemia. But in less than 5%, there are other unusual etiologies, such as uh, vasculitis, of which the most important one, I would say, for, for mesenteric disease would be large vessel vasculitis, tachiasis, or giant cell. We have seen also polyarteritis nodosa, and I've seen also systemic lupus. Neurofibromatosis is, is rare, but... It can cause actually mid aortic syndrome and narrowings, particularly in children or young adults. Uh, we know about aortic coarctation and dissections can actually cause a, a flow uh, limitation into the SMA and celiac axis, leading to symptoms of mesenteric ischemia. We also know about embolization and trauma. Now, some of the classic facts we see in textbooks are, again, it's an osteo disease. Most often, symptomatic patients have at least two of the three arteries affected. Progression to mesenteric thrombosis leads to bowel infarction, multi-system organ failure, and death. And in fact, this is a very rewarding pathology because revascularization often leads to immediate symptom relief. And it's nice to see these patients, they often are having symptoms for over a year, uh, be able to have a meal the day or the day after a revascularization. Now, the intestine has a tremendous reserve, uh, which is illustrated here by this patient. This is a professor at the uh, Mich uh, Michigan, University of Michigan, that was referred to me with a torical abdominal aneurysm and had the chronic occlusion of the celiac axis, a very high grade stenose of the SMA, and even an stenosed IMA, and uh, no symptoms. Uh, it was a very elderly patient. We decided to follow. It never really became symptomatic. And it's because of this reserve that we have with numerous collaterals. You can see here on this patient in, uh, via the arc of Riolan and also the arc of Buehler via the gastroduodenal artery as well, the collaterals between the celiac uh, SMA and the uh, inferior mesenteric artery. The screening of these patients is start usually with a mesenteric duplex ultrasound. Uh, it's important for the residents and fellows to know some of these numbers here. This is the classic velocity established by Moneta in a prospective study in the early 90s was a celiac axis peak systolic velocity uh, of 200 centimeters per second and the SMA uh, greater than 275 centimeters per second. 
uh, and the Bauer Sox criteria established by the Dartmouth group was, and then the stolic velocity of uh, 45. And you can see here the sensitivity of this for a greater than 70% stenosis is very high, 92%, specificity 96%. So that should be the starting test. Now it is important uh, to have a good study that these patients are actually fasting for at least eight hours, ideally, uh, before we consider uh, doing the, the screening ultrasound. Usually that's not an issue with mesenteric ischemia because they like to fast most of the time. They have a lot of pain. What should we do with asymptomatic disease? This is another landmark study from Wisdom Salem by Dr. Wilson. It's a prospective cohort of 553 elderly individuals who were screened. They identified 90 patients who had high-grade stenosis or occlusion of the CELIC or SMA. That was 18% of the cohort. They followed these patients prospectively, actually, and none of them had symptoms over a seven-year period. So here is, is a classic board answer for those that are gonna sit for the oral boards is that you don't mess with an asymptomatic isolated mesenteric lesion. Uh, there is no indication for, revascularis for prophylactic revascularization on these patients. Now with three vessel high grade disease, uh, stenosis or occlusion, that's a different story. I mean, the, the truth is we don't know really what the right answer is. Uh, there is a small study by Thomas, also a prospective study, of 82 patients. They identified 15 who had severe three vessel disease. And four of those patients over a median follow-up of three years developed mesenteric ischemia. Now, three of them were chronic and they were treated, but one was acute. So I'll tell you what I usually do is if the patient is from a remote location or has difficult access to medical care, and particularly if it has a lesion that is suitable, I lean towards offering a prophylactic revascularization for this category of severe high-grade trivessel disease. Having said that, I, I think I have to acknowledge that this is very controversial, and, and the truth is we don't know what the right answer is. Now, I had a, a big interest on mesenteric ischemia dating from my years as a resident and fellow, and in 2003, we started the prospective database at Mayo. And uh, eventually when I got dove into the fenestrated uh, area, I kind of lost interest on this, but we had numerous uh, papers and numerous fellows that came along the training that we did a, a series of papers. And in fact, uh, even uh, edited a book on mesenteric vascular disease and I have some copies of this here in the office if anyone is interested. But this is one of the early looks in our database of uh, 229 consecutive patients. You can see here, there is a female to male ratio of three to one. The mean age is 65 years old. Uh, mean symptom duration of nine months. Almost every patient has abdominal pain. Weight loss in 84%. Food fear in 45%. And that is difficult to gather from retrospective review. You really have to ask the patient adequately. And, you know, most often they don't say that they have fear of eating. Most often what they say is that they change their eating habits and they don't eat anymore that steak that they like to do it in the past. Uh, and if you ask why, you know, that's because I have pain. So, I mean, that is, that's actually food fear. You know, it's just that they don't verbalize that. You have to get that from the patient. Sometimes you have diarrhea, you have nausea and vomiting. And the recommendations for revascularization is that these are indicated in patients with symptoms. And there is no role for long-term parenteral nutrition without revascularization. That is not something that should be considered unless, of course, the patient has a limited short, uh, life expectancy and there is absolutely no means that you can you can offer a revascularization, but this is really not the, the, the correct answer. And again, prophylactic revascularization is usually not indicated. And I would say careful surveillance or perhaps endovascular therapy in a patient with asymptomatic, really severe trivessel disease.
So let's go through some of the options of revascularization. You know, we have a variety of options. I know people have different preferences and we can debate that at the end of this talk. We have the, the classic transaortic mesenteric endarterectomy bypass of a variety of types. We can select different areas for inflow, whether it's anti-grade or retrograde configuration, whether it's a single or double bypass. Retrograde open mesenteric stenting, ROMS, is a very neat technique that I think it has uh, in indications. We'll talk about that. And of course, endovascular therapy with angioplasty and primary stenting. Now, in terms of mesenteric bypass, which at least at the Mayo Clinic was the favorite number one option for open revascularization, that was usually done with a midline incision, transperitoneal approach. Sometimes we did bilateral subcostal incision. Less frequently, we have done retroperitoneal approach. The selection of the incision was largely based on the body habitus, the source of inflow for the bypass, the presence or not of other concomitant aortic pathology, such as an aneurysm or in a case that will illustrate to you, coarctation. A few key aspects about the exposure. You know, you really have to cut alongside the, the um, xiphoid if you decide to do a midline incision, you release six aponeuroses and you really are able to expose the supraciliac aorta. Our preference, as I will show on the lower risk group that's three by open, was to do a supraciliac based bypass. So we retract the esophagus to the left side, put a nasogastric tube, take the triangular ligament of the uh, left lobe of the liver, retract to the right, open the lesser sac transect the diaphragmatic crude right on top of the aorta, and then you clean the supraciliac aorta and skeletonize the, the, usually I don't dissect the celiac axis, quite frankly, I dissect the hepatic artery, and then create a retropancreatic tunnel and expose the superior mesenteric artery as shown on this illustration by David Factor. Now, we really were very fond of using the supraciliac aorta for source of inflow because it's often spared from calcifications. Uh, it does provide excellent anti-grade uh, source of inflow, as you can see here. And uh, uh, Dr. Ken Cherry, you know, who was one of the staff at Mayo, designed this clamp, the Cherry clamp, and for years he would give the graduating fellows this clamp uh, until my class because it became a little too expensive. So I, I didn't have, fortunately we had the clamp at Mayo. But he highlighted a few technical points, which I, I think uh, sometimes are not in the textbooks, but are, are actually very important. It's kind of shown here on this illustration. We do not a transverse or longitudinal in, incision. We prefer to use a slight oblique incision as shown here. And we actually transect the graft, not completely transverse, but slightly ob oblique in a way that the left limb of the graft, which is going to serve the superior mesenteric artery, is slightly posterior in relation to the right limb. And I'll tell you, one of the things about writing about this disease is you get referred patients. And I, I've done several, actually, redo bypasses because of buckled limbs that occluded you know, from other institutions. So you can see here on the illustration of factor, it's a slightly shadow there, but the left limb is slightly more, more posterior. The sec second aspect that I would highlight is be very careful not to do excessive retraction of the jejunal branches because you can really avulse some of these branches. And my preference, and this is something I learned from, again, Dr. Bauer, was to use these small Segita clips to, to control the vessels and, and avoid traumatizing the vessels. And oftentimes, actually, with the, the more difficult anastomosis, I interrupt the toe of the anastomosis to avoid purse string, uh, the, the distal part of the anastomosis. The other aspect that we've done routinely, pretty much for every mesenteric renal bypass or carotid reconstruction done for occlusive disease, is intraoperative duplex ultrasound interrogation 
to make sure that the reconstruction is really technically perfect and that you are not going to miss out on a dissection flap, residual stenosis, or any technical problem that will lead to an early occlusion. That's something that I hope for now that Tanila joined here, that we can actually bring to, to the, the TMC is some of this is higher end intraoperative duplex ultrasound assessment for reconstructions. Here is the final view of, of this two vessel supracilic uh, hepatic and SMA bypass, which was our favorite option for the good risk patients that we elected to do open reconstruction. But there are other alternatives. You know, Peter Pyrolero, who actually was trained by by the Bakey Crawford as well, I think in the in the seventies. Uh, one of his options for, as a bailout after an aortic reconstruction, for example, if the patient had some uh, mesenteric ischemia or it, there was no source of inflow, was this stovepipe reconstruction, which I I got to do with him as a resident uh, one time. The other option, this was really championed a lot by the group of Oregon, Dr. John Porter, and it's important for the residents to know some of these landmark publications from the 80s and 90s, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. It's very critical that you guys start pulling out some of these classic publications and that you build your fund of knowledge. So if you went to the SVS meeting in the 1990s, the debate was not about stent versus open. It was about retrograde versus integrate revascularization. And, and the, the Oregon group with Dr. Porter, Lloyd, Lloyd Taylor, Moneta, they were really champions of, of the iliomesenteric bypass, which it is a suitable, nice option on the patient that is higher risk, that has supracilic or inferino calcification preventing safe placement of a clamp. So it's something to be considered. Now, when I do this, my preference is to use uh, a Dacron graft. I, I'm not very fond of PTFE graft. I don't think you need to use ringed. I usually use a seven or eight millimeter Dacron graft. Now, what's important at the end is you wanna cover that with some momentum or the retroperitoneum so you don't get to have a, a fistula later on. Sometimes you can't do it from the right side because of iliac disease. That's a patient I had to do it from the left side. You can still do it from the left side. In terms of open strategies, at least at Mayo, these were by far the two most common utilized, but I will be talking a little bit about transaortic and arterectomy as well. This is actually a very neat operation. I think it is a technically a very pleasing operation as well to do. It does take more dissection. It does take uh, probably more ischemia time than, than the, a supra uh, celiac bypass. Nonetheless, is a very valid option. And it's nice because you don't have prosthetic material. So if you have an acute uh, uh, mesenteric ischemia with contamination, that is, is an option. And also if you have a big cauliflower calcified plaque, that you don't, that you think you need to treat in the AOR, again, that's a, a valid option as well. Endovascular therapy has uh, took, taken off really since the early 2000s. And for years, I wrote and wrote a lot about this, uh, you know, recommending to do it from the brachial approach. And I think nowadays with the steerable shifts, you really don't need to do that. Uh, but some of the things I'm going to be discussing are the use of filters, uh, as illustrated on this case, and the use of covert stents. That are tough to beat is the fact that it's done under a local anesthesia with a small puncture. It does have unquestionably low morbidity and low mortality, a very short hospital stay, usually of one night, a very fast recovery, and it's highly effective. And if you do it carefully, you don't really burn any bridges for a bypass. So I do think it should be the first line of treatment. And I'm not alone on this. If you see in the United States, endovascular has taken off and around 2002, it surpassed open revascularization as the primary method. And this is largely based on the fact that the reality is that open revascularization in most centers carry high mortality. And in fact, on Medicare beneficiaries, the average mortality is 
At Mayo, we also observed the same trend around 2002, and I apologize, we missed the years here. Uh, end of ASCRA has taken off and open has declined. Nonetheless, we continue to do open, uh, I would say about five to 10 cases a year uh, since I left. Now, when we look at large pool of data, as it happens with most of the endovascular revascularizations, we see less mortality in blue, uh, less morbidity, shorter length of stay, and perhaps a slight less um, symptom relief, although there is a bias here, which is the bias of what we call a therapeutic trial. Patients that have atypical symptoms that people say, well, let's do a stent and see what happens. And I think we have much, much a higher threshold to recommend an open revascularization. So that, that to me explains some of the difference in efficacy. But unquestionably, uh, mesenteric stenting has a higher recurrence rate, higher reintervention rate, more risk stenosis, and a lower primary patency, although secondary patency can be quite good. Now, there is one very good systematic review published in the Journal of Vascular Surgery with nine retrospective papers, which, pro, uh, which uh, show, again, uh, lower mortality for, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, no difference in mortality for any, or, or morbidity for the revascularizations. But again, endovascular was associated with more recurrent symptoms, more reinterventions, and a, and a lower primary patency rate. But there are problems with the mesenteric literature, which are quite significant. First of all, all these papers are retrospective, and many of them have spent over two decades to accumulate a decent number of patients for these authors to report. There is often the inclusion of mixed etiologies, such as acute and chronic, or even median arcuate ligament in some of these papers. There is a huge selection bias towards one or other therapy and there is a lack of risk stratified outcomes or even objective patency evaluation in most of these papers. So when I was uh, a fellow, I, I did this paper looking at risk stratified outcomes. And this was, I think, one of my first presentations at the SVS plenary session. I was very nervous, I remember. And uh, we had 229 patients, 146 open, 83 endo. And, you know, I struggled, but how we would define in a retrospective fashion high risk with this small cohort. And I decided to use the SVS high risk comorbidity score, which is largely based on aortic disease. But I think it's unquestionable, unquestionably, Anyone that is higher than 80 or has this severe pulmonary cardiac or renal dysfunction is probably not the best case for an aortic-based reconstruction, and that was the, the rationale. Well, we found, not surprisingly, that there were more high-risk patients on the endovascular group. Uh, they had also a uh, more advanced age and more significant cardiovascular risk factors, not only the presence of cardiovascular risk factors, but the severity of cardiovascular risk factors was higher in the endovascular group. We did not find any difference in mortality rate. They were actually nearly identical, but it was very interested that in the open group, low risk using primarily supracelic bypass, the mortality was actually under 1%, which was remarkable. And even on the higher risk group, the mortality was 6.7%, which was comparing favorably to most of the literature. And for the end of ASCAR, you can see here, we didn't have many low risk, but the mortality for the high risk was acceptable. Having said that, I like to point out that even though it's a much simpler procedure in many ways, the mortality for mesenteric stent, in fact, is higher than an EVAR mortality and, and some of the TVAR mortalities in some of the series. So we have to be very careful with these patients. They are very frail. Length of stay was shorter. There were less complications with endovascular, uh, in particularly less uh, pulmonary problems, gastrointestinal, cardiac problems. Uh, 
I will point out some of the problems that I've seen over the years. One is GI bleeding, you know, particularly after starting Plavix, particularly on the patient that presents with acute or subacute symptoms. And if you have the general surgery team resect a bowel, my recommendation is that they do a continuous anastomosis and not stapled anastomosis because I had two patients over the years that they bled so much they had to take back and anastomosis because there was so much bleeding from it. Now, we also looked at this score at the early mortality and the five-year mortality, and there was actually excellent correlation, you can see here, between the number of factors and the early and late mortality. That was very interesting. Now, the patency rate was much better primary for open, 89 versus 41%, and also the secondary patency. But I want to pause a little bit and remind you, this is now 2004, 2005, when we stopped the analysis on the end on this paper. And for the reasons that they don't know, at that point in time, we still had to mount palma stents in balloons, and there was no covert stents. So we'll see what happens now with the evolution of the stance. We looked also at whether a single versus double stenting helped. And we found absolute no difference between doing only an SMA stent versus an SMA and a CELIC stent. So there is really no support in the literature, at least no go good support in the literature to do multiple vessel stenting. I would recommend to do that in patients that have severe gastric ischemia in addition to bowel ischemia and very poor gastroduodenal collaterals. You know, if you do an endoscopy, you see a lot of ulcers there. You have a high-grade stenosis or occlusion of the celiac. I think it's reasonable to do that. But there are very important limitations of the endovascular approach. Early limitations with complications and late limitations with reinterventions. One of the early complications that caught my attention was the risk of embolization. Now, this was a very difficult case early on after I came from Cleveland, and we had a long segment occlusion that I had to recanalize, and it was a flush occlusion. So actually, the way I did this is I went from the IMA with a microcatheter, and then I puffed, and I was able to show where the stump was, and eventually I recanalized. But when I was done, you can see this major embolization of the main trunk of the SMA. I used an export aspiration catheter and we were able to open up the SMA. There was some residual dissection, but the patient actually did well, didn't have any other issues. But that prompted me to postulate whether uh, use of filters were gonna help with some of the challenging cases but there is a challenge because, you know, if you put the filter too far down in the SMA, the problem is that you protect the main trunk, but there is a variety of branches that are not going to be protected. And if you put too close to the lesion, you have the risk of this filter getting entrapped into the mesh of the stent. So we actually did a study to look at the instance of embolization and the location of the embolization and a subsequent study to actually map the anatomy of the SMA. The, the first study we did was to look at the, the instance of embolization, and we also mapped the SMA, as you can see here. That was Tanila with Terra Recon, which, by the way, I'm trying to get it here for all of us. She mapped, actually, the number of vessels. We divided the SMA into stations to look at the diameter and how many vessels branched off after each station. Well, we had 85 patients all treated by SMA stands without filter, and we found seven that had embolization, and you can see these are real embolizations. We're not making this up. Uh, you can see some of them here. And we treated five with catheter respiration, two with no treatment. And at the end, actually, we didn't find a statistical difference for mortality, but it was interesting that there were two deaths among the seven patients who had embolization and none of those that didn't. Uh, we also found higher morbidity rate, uh, more uh, ischemia, longer length of stay. 
Now, we identified uh, by univariate analysis that occlusion, um, length of lesion, and severe calcification, and I would add subsequently also subacute or acute symptoms were the factors associated with embolization. So, my recommendation is to consider use a filter if it is an occlusion, acute ischemia, or subacute ischemia. But I think for a simple stenosis, we probably don't need to do that. Now, what size of filter we need to do? Use most of the time a six or seven millimeter filter it will protect 93 percent of the branch vessels if, if parked on station four, which is about five or six centimeters distal to the origin of the aorta. The second issue we found was the issue of restenosis. And this was one of the first patients I treated there with restenosis from intimal hyperplasia. And because we were having good results with fenestratographs with covert stents, we did that with covert stents. That led to another paper that was also presented at the vascular annual meeting comparing bare metal with covert stents. And we did something that I think should be done with these papers, which is to divide the cohort of stenting into a primary intervention group, which is an index intervention in a native vessel versus a reintervention group. And we compare bare metal with covert stents. And a story short is technical success and early outcomes are identical, but covert stents have a far better freedom from symptom recurrence and far better uh, freedom from reintervention and actually improved patency rates, similar to actually what is achieved with open repair. Now, uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna jump a few slides. The problem with covert stance is that, is that their failure mechanism is usually of acute occlusion of the stent and not restenosis. This is a physician from the Mayo Clinic that was patient of Dr. Glowiski and I helped by doing a stent. And you can see there was some residual stenosis from severe calcification here, very modest. But you know, after 18 months, he came with acute occlusion. Fortunately, no uh, acute mesenteric ischemia, but we were able to do, uh, Dr. Glowiski actually did this ileo SMA bypass. The other mechanism is stent edge stenosis from, from intimal hyperplasia. So you have to be careful when you dilate these stents that you don't over inflate the balloon. I would recommend just going to profile. Then you deflate the balloon, back it a little bit. And then you go to town and really dilate because that way you avoid traumatizing the edge of the vessel. You know, and uh, we had an extended series of these with longer follow-up, and you can see that there were some occlusions and some restenosis, but the reintervention rate was still substantially better and lower than the bare metal stent. So, how do we select patients nowadays? You know, I think it's about the lesion. If you have a suitable lesion, you should do endovascular. If you have a super difficult lesion like this, then you probably should do open. Uh, nonetheless, there are some patients with very difficult lesions that we don't want to operate because they they are very sick. They have super severe COPD, ischemic cardiomyopathy, or they are cacatic. And I'll show you some cases where endovascular can be done. This is a 44 year old female who had abdominal radiation for Wilms tumor and uh, presented with chronic mesenteric ischemia and very difficult lesion. I was able to recanalize this from the arm using a coaxial system, which again, the fellows should learn to build up a stiff system. You use a sheath, a guide, and a catheter. You hub the lesion, and then you drill through it. And once you cross it, you confirm you are in the true lumen. And on this case, we actually use the filter device you can see it there. We have a 0.035 system loaded over a 0.14 filter and a 0.18 wire, and that provides better support. And you can see the final result on this patient after the stenting, which was very satisfactory. And this patient, actually, I follow until I left from Mayo. She did require one reintervention with a covert stent. This, the initial one was done, I guess, 10 years ago. The other one, 
four or five years ago, but she has been doing okay. There are some other patients that have super difficult lesions, and I, I, I would argue, you know, you can do a bypass, of course, or endotracotomy, but, you know, this is a tough case to, to crack, and they probably have high mortality rate. So this one, I actually did a combination of a percutaneous aterectomy to debulk the lesion, and and then stenting. And I will show you a neat technique that I learned from interventional cardiology. So the other thing you guys have to do is to go to the CAT lab and see the cardiologist work. And this is something you can use on the internal iliac artery for iliac disease or in a difficult bifurcated lesion. And this is the technique. You use a self-expandable open cell stent across the lesion. You cannulate the cell, and then you put a balloon expandable stent into the cell. And that's what we did on this case. And you can see here a very good technical result. And again, you can use this on your iliac artery or in other bif bifurcation lesions. But finally, there are some patients that need open. And let's talk a little bit about that. This is a patient referred to me for a stent that I elected to do open. I felt it was a very long lesion, super calcified, full of thrombus, and I did actually a supracelic uh, SMA and uh, celiac bypass. Again, transiotic endotracotomy is a good option, and uh, I would love to have Dr. Safi at the end share his experience with that. Uh, this is a paper from the group of uh, Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, Dr. Asher with 80 patients, a 30-day mortality of 3.8%, which is remarkably good, taking into account that 26% of patients had acute uh, mesenteric ischemia. Now, what you should not do is what this young patient had done. This is a young patient with Moya Moya that was treated uh, at an outside institution with very long stenting across branches. And that now is a much more delicate and difficult situation, but Dr. Bauer was able to navigate that with a bypass. I think actually he used uh, this, he used PTFE, but the other idea on these patients that he, he has done many now is to use the SFA and then replace the SFA with a PTFE. And that provides a very nice conduit for patients that have some of these difficult diseases from vasculitis. Now, this one of the nice things about being a young staff at Mayo is that you are thrown into the trenches right away. And this was one of my early cases as a staff. And again, for the residents, this is neurofibromatosis type 1 or von Richtenhausen disease. And this is manifested with a triad of neurofibromas. Uh, hyperpigmentation in the color portion of the eye, which is called leash nodules, and cafe au lait uh, maculus. And this is the triad of uh, neurofibromatosis, which can cause mediaortic syndrome and mesenteric ischemia, as shown on this case. Another case that we treated with weird pathology, and that illustrates the importance of a very well done CT angiography, uh, is vasculitis. And you can see here the thickening of the wall, and the very classic vasculitis of the SMA and both renal arteries, which we treated with a trifurcated supracelic graft. And you can see the biopsy here uh, with the giant cell, uh, consistent with giant cell arteritis. Uh, Evan Ryer was one of our fellows, look at the outcomes of open in the endovascular era. and uh, he found there was no difference in mortality, despite the fact that in the endovascular era, we're treating sicker patients with more cardiovascular risk factors because these are patients that are not candidates for endo. They, they failed endo or they are not candidates for endo. And actually, they have worse disease, more occlusions and more trivassal disease. And despite that, there was no difference in recurrence or patency. Now, briefly, to go to acute mesenteric ischemia, I do think this is changing. Classically, in the textbooks, you'll see embolism as the main cause. We are seeing more and more uh, acute on chronic uh, thrombosis, 
This is manifested by abrupt or insidious onset of severe abdominal pain, the classic pain out of proportion to physical findings. You need to have a high index of suspicion. Do not rely on labs such as lactate, white blood count, etc. You can see dead bowel with a normal white count and a normal lactate. Of course, that helps corroborate, but you should not decide on the basis of that. And to me, the best test is a CT and geography. Uh, it's fast, it's effective, it's non-invasive, it shows the etiology, it shows whether there is bowel gangrene, and you can plan the intervention. Like on this case, that shows a target sign on the SMA, and that is an embolus. And to me, this is one of the appendectomies of vascular or cardiovascular surgery. You should go to the OR and do an embolectomy and not monk around with uh, angioplasty stents and, and stuff like that. But some of the cases you want to do endovascular uh, or you want to do open. You know, here's some of the classic treatment, uh, embolectomy, with or without a patch. If there's some calcification, you can put a patch. Bypass or endotrectomy. Endotrectomy is very appealing if there is contamination because there is no prosthetic. But ROMS is a very neat technique for this indication. It can be fast, efficient, and avoid prosthetic. Um, we looked at our data, and in the interest of time, I want to talk a little bit about ROMS. Uh, the nice thing about this is direct SMA axis. You can actually control the side branches. You can evaluate the bowel immediately. You don't need to harvest a vein. You don't need to mess with a conduit or an aortic clamp. Now, my piece of advice that I told the fellows, don't use a short sheath like this. Otherwise, you're going to radiate your hands. Use a longer sheath, like a 50-centimeter sheath. So stay away from the radiation. That's a, a, a trick to, to do. Now, on this paper of ROMS, most had a, acute mesenteric ischemia. And again, here is the technique. You control the vessels. You do a puncture uh, across the lesion with a wire, confirm you are in the true lumen, and then you use a stent, bare metal or covert stent. I would avoid covert stent if there is contamination. And this is the tip that I have at the end flush the sheath multiple times and don't hesitate to open the artery and look inside because I found in more than one case residual thrombus inside and this is a cause of early failure. So it's best to open the artery, take the thrombus, use the balloon for proximal control and then close that over a patch. I like to use a bovine patch for that. Mortality on this paper was quite high. And that illustrates that a lot of these patients, unfortunately, are, are late in the presentation. Uh, patient survival, as you can see, is much less than the expected uh, survival for the population, mostly due to the early mortality. Uh, and the patency, I, I think it's similar to what we get for chronic mesenteric ischemia. Freedom from recurrence was 72%. So in conclusion, when should we stand? Well, I think we should stand all patients that have a suitable lesion and that, that should be considered. That The best ones are the short segment SMA stenosis, but also some of the long segment recanalizations. Over stents have improved outcome, but I think, uh, you know, it's more costly. Uh, for difficult lesions, uh, I put on this old slide that we favor brachial approach. I think you should now try femoral with a steerable sheath if it is a difficult lesion, but if it is really difficult, brachial is the best support you have. Open, don't forget about open. These are very neat operations. I think you have excellent results. You should consider them, particularly on a low-risk patient that have a, a good aortic base source for inflow, or even on a high-risk patient that failed endovascular or is not a candidate for endovascular. So thank you very much. I think with any disease that is infrequent, you should pull the little evidence you have with the experience that you have and the patient preference that you have to make a decision. So with that, thank you very much, guys, and I'm happy to entertain questions now.
Gustavo, thank you very much. Uh, you saved me reading a, a chapter for my recertification in mesenteric artery. It's a beautiful illustration, as well as the point you want to make, and that's a credit to you and to Mayo. It's, as always, I'm impressed in Mayo Clinic. It's uh, since the 1870, it's on the top of the world. I don't know how they made it. They attract vitality people like you. You mentioned about endorectomy for the uh, visceral area. And uh, about 5 to 10% of our thoracoabdominal aortic aneurysm, you have to do that in order to put the patch. Uh, so we learn how to do anorectomy. And it's if it's done right and you have the feathering, it's very, very satisfying operation. And so from that, I, you know, you reserve a protocol abdominal incision. I'm not fond of trap door. And actually, I was a heated discussion with San Francisco people because they call it coral reef. It's, it's atherosclerosis. It's really no different than any atherosclerosis. And somebody put it in the, in the one of the uh, discussion, I was discussing with them that I accused them of smoking something illegal in California. <laughs> to use the coral reef. Uh, but we, it, it, I agree with you. If you can do it with the stent, it's OK. But surgery is not bad. One difference between Mayo Clinic experience with the bifurcation, if I use the supraciliac, I, I like to do individual graph, like graph number 10 to the celiac. From that, I'll put another 10 or 8 to the superior mesenteric artery. Uh, otherwise, it's a beautiful lecture. Congratulations. Thanks, Dr. Safi. Uh, I mean, those are excellent points. And I think that, uh, uh, I mean, you have such a, a vast experience on this area that uh, we should listen and learn from, from your, your points. I think these are very good points about the, the role of Transaortic and arteriectomy, and you know, with your familiarity with that area of so many toric abdominal aneurysms, uh, I, I'm sure this is is a, is a great option. And uh, it's a good point about the trap door. In fact, the the few I, I would like to see what you think, but the few that I've done, I didn't really do a trap door. I did more an incision towards the left side of the aorta, actually starting from below the renal. And then uh, it was more like longitudinal, slightly, slightly curved around, but not a formal trap door. Uh, and then after I, I did their tractomy closed, I, I transferred the clamp down. And in these cases, usually I had to do some aortic reconstruction, actually, infrarenal. And that was the, the main impetus for me to do it. Uh, the other point you raised about the graft is very important, and I'm sure one of the reasons you do that is to avoid kinks and to have the optimal configuration of the graft just on how it lays into the patient, which I think, again, for the residents and fellows, it's the key when you do these reconstructions is to have this three-dimensional view of how the graft is going to lay, because you don't want to end up having to redo it or have a kink at the end. Gustavo, I had a question for you on the retrograde uh, recanalization. I've done a few of those. Um, they're really excellent cases when it comes to the contaminated abdomens or bowel. You know, you have to do a bowel resection sim simultaneously with general surgery. But what kind of lesions have you noticed with your experience that you try to avoid um, when you have a um, patient that comes in, obviously, with acute lump scheme? I'm sorry, acute mesenteric ischemia. I think, Karosh, the biggest challenge is that patient that has a big rock at the origin of the SMA that you don't see even uh, when you window level to the bone window, you don't see any tract on that rock that you can see your wire going. You could try it, but I'm not surprised in those cases if the wire goes sub intimo and you start going into a dissection plane in the aorta. And I think, <coughs> I think that's the time to stop. Uh, 
But again, it's something that you can try because, you know, at the end of the day where you puncture the SMA there, it might be the source of your uh, anastomosis for, for your bypass, whether you're going to do a retrograde pass or, or, or an integrate. So I, 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 in most cases, worth the try. But we did have some failures on that series, and it was from this severe calcification. Well, you know, the anorectomy, it's an art more than a science, how to do it. I was involved in a, a group of a, a surgeon, and, and they were trying to do anorectomy of the common femoral artery. That's a few years back when I was in the other hospital, and they asked me to come and help them to do something. When I looked at it, <clears throat> they were so aggressive, there was no artery left. So if you go in the wrong uh, this in the wrong plane, you are done. It's it's really an art. You have to do it. It's a dying art because the dinosaur like me are going to check out either physically or technically. And it's 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 very important to learn how to do it. I agree with you wholeheartedly. It's very uh, gratifying. Uh, uh, but it's it's not you know there is no free lunch. Anything you do has side effects, has complication. Anyone who will tell you he did all this operation without any death, without any mortality, they are lying. I remember my one of my <clears throat> friends, and he is my mentor in Bentav, told me you have to do first hundred carotid without a single complication, no stroke. So I looked at him, I'm not God, so how can you do an operation without complication? Uh, but I, you know, I don't know how to, it's it's not, it's, you know, it, it takes time to, to develop and you have, first of all, I, one time I gave a talk in the Society for Vascular Surgery, how to do anorectomy. And I will tell them it's just like peeling the banana. Unfortunately, I couldn't make the, picture because the artist made it almost R-rated. So <laughs> uh, the way you do the anorectomy, you don't pull on the plaque. The, your pickup or hemostat, whatever, is to stabilize it in gentle pull. You peel the wall of the artery from the plaque. This is whatever that's a golden or silver or brass uh, nugget you have. You don't pull on because if you pull, you're going to cut it and you'll end up with a mess. You have to peel the, uh, the wall of the artery just like you're peeling a banana. That's what I can, in my mind. Beautiful, Dr. Safi. Gustavo, this is Steve. Uh, great talk. Could you uh, speak to your anticoagulation therapy after stent placement? Um, at least in the coronary literature, we know that there's up to 20% of patients are non-responders to Plavix. And particularly dealing in relatively small vessels, there is the risk of both acute and chronic occlusion. Um, do you use Plavix? Do you use another agent? How long do you recommend that the agent be anticoagulated? And do you check to see if they're non-responders or not? That's a very good point, Steve. I, I do use double antiplatelet therapy if I use a covert stent. And uh, I try to actually recommend those uh, long term for what kind? Disease. What's the name of them? I, get, I don't like medication. That's how I went to surgery. What what kind of medication? Clop Clopidogrel and aspirin. Aspirin, okay. Uh, and I, I want to raise a few points that are important. Uh, on the acute mesenteric ischemia, I would avoid a covert stent because the covert stent is a more prone to thrombosis than the bare metal, you know, by, by essence of the fact it has PKFP on it. Uh, and I had problems with Plavix in the acute cohort. They ha often have ulcerations in the small bowel or if they had a bowel resection. Sometimes, as I said, they keep oozing from the anastomosis and we had some patients back and forth to the OR with GI bleeding after the mesenteric stenting. So I, I shied away of doing that on the acute ischemia. But for the chronic, Steve, I usually, after a, uh, an uneventful procedure, I load them with Plavix. Uh, and if if they are bare metal, I keep the Plavix and aspirin for six weeks or so and then go to aspirin. 
after that. Uh, I haven't checked for resistance to clopidogrel uh, on almost any cohort. Uh, I would say maybe with a, a few cases they had failures and then I, uh, we checked at that point. I don't know that we should do it routinely or how costly that is. Um, but that that was what what I what I tended to do. Do you recommend uh, because now the uh, whatever the Food Drug Administration have a warning regarding the uh, paclitaxel, the uh, drug eluding in in the peripheral? Is it still apply in the abdominal? Increase mortality rate over. Five ten years. Well, Dr. Saf, I would love to hear what the others have to comment on that. My understanding is there was a signal on this meta-analysis with higher mortality. There were subsequent meta-analyses that were done that showed no signal. So it, there is controversy, uh, and and my understanding is that they light up on the recommendation to allow people to do it. Most centers, I'll tell you what we were doing at Mayo, is to reserving this for the case that we felt absolutely would benefit because of high of a risk stenosis or, or we predicted a high rate of risk stenosis due to a small vessel with long segment lesion. Uh, well, my friend, if I have mesenteric artery occlusion and you put the, don't put one of these in me. I don't want to shorten my lifespan. I, I haven't used on the mesenterics the drug eluding technology. I think for the SFA is the antibios is most of what what has been done. But again, why why don't we have the the team here comment on that? What do you think about the drug eluding technology? Can can I? To interrupt, second, there are four questions in the chat, and I think they're all pretty easy, quick questions. So maybe we can get to that before the talk is over. Okay. Uh, okay. Sophie is going to go ahead and moderate the questions. So okay. the first question is from Zane. <clears throat> Two questions: What type of coverage stent do you use? ICAST, VBX, and how do you size? And what kind of conduit do you use in trauma? So uh, I use the cheapest, which is on our experience was the ICAST. And the, unfortunately the VBX was the double the price of the ICAST. So I use the, I like the VBX, but, uh, and, and it's more flexible, but it was about $2,500 for a stand versus 1200. That's what we were paying at Mayo. I see another question from Caesar on the use of the uh, bulking. A terectomy Caesar. So I think that this has not really been reported in a couple of cases with highly calcified lesions. But I, I think it's something that can be tried again in a case that is adverse and for some reason we really don't want to do open. Um, probably you have a rate of complication with a terectomy, like embolization, things like that, that you should be mindful uh, when when you you decide. But you know, I got got away with a couple of cases about issues. I don't have much experience. I use it. Um, I use it recently, actually, for a case and um, just before um, f to treat an instant stenosis before deploying um, a, a, a covered stent uh, inside of it, and it it it, it worked well. But I, I don't know if maybe um, a covered stent without the atherectomy would have done as well and that's why i was wondering if you had any experience with it i don't scissor but i i, I agree with you for a pristinosis use a covert stent because it it will be better i think um and then there's another question by dr coogan would you mind commenting on open treatment of median arcuate ligament syndrome versus laparoscopic release of the median arcuate ligament my bias is to do it open. Of course, I'm not a laparoscopic surgeon. Having said that, uh, I was fond of laparoscopic and referred several until uh, I was called in the operating room with one of my patients and a fire drill because they basically opened a big hole in the aorta and I had to do a patch. And story short, the patient was saved and everything, but it made me think about that and I also don't think that, unless you are a, a very thorough laparoscopic surgeon, 
that they do as much of the cleaning that we do. So I do an open uh, release, uh, usually through a midline supra umbilical incision. Um, and again, that we have the group here. Uh, one idea that I think we should do is develop these specialty clinics on the department to try to attract certain groups of patients that are almost underserved everywhere. One of them is median arcuate ligament. The other one, for example, thoracic outlet syndrome or athletic injuries from, from you know, popliteal entrapment, things like that. So um, that's something that I was uh, developing at Mayo and I'm hoping to actually start here multidisciplinary with several that are interested, whoever is interested on that. Uh, uh, because, you know, these patients, they all are very young. They shop around the, all over the country to find uh, where they want to be treated. And, and uh, that's usually what I do is open for that. Well, I agree with you. And I, you know, anyone who, uh, uh, it's, it's media arco that we want to see it, to see it through. When we do thoracoabdominal abdominal articanurism with the incision, you can see it in front of you. That's why the, when, the way I do the medial arcma release is uh, through uh, thoracoabdominal abdominal incision. I, I don't do this operation a lot, but I did it when one guy who was a Baptist preacher and my wife, a Southern Baptist, and the guy did well uh, to my surprise. I mean, I cut it completely. It's not only cutting that, but you have to relieve the uh, other thing around the uh, celiac axis. I agree with you, the uh, endoscopic uh, release, whatever, laparoscopic release of the, uh, if it kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that that patient was uh, saved because it's it's usually deadly complication when you put a hole there. Uh, so I, I shy away from referring for lapros, laparoscopic things. We used to have a very active uh, thoracic outlet. It's Ali Azizade who trained with uh, uh, what Robert Thompson and and uh, and he used the supraciliac uh, approach, which I really liked. Uh, so I don't know who's interested in our group. Naveed, are you interested? Yes, sir. He's not here. I'm here. Yes, I'm interested in TUS. Yeah, we don't know if you don't talk. You have to talk and tell us how many cases you did since Dr. Christopher left and Dr. Ali Aziz, because you, you are trained with them. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm on the, uh, we did the combined papers we've written on uh, TUS. Uh, I've done around 30 cases since I've joined here. Um, and uh, it seems like after Dr. Christopher Chaltanau is gone, there are more patients that we are doing. So in a year, I'll give you an update. Hopefully, we'll double that number. Talk, talk, talk to Gustavo. He, he, so you can make a clinic and you can do it. Yes, sir. Uh, I, you know, I first time I scrubbed on thoracic outlet syndrome was in Baghdad with my mentor, Yusuf. That's why my name, my son name is Joseph. And we did it the transaxillary approach. I couldn't see anything. And he was doing it, and the guy was, uh, uh, you know, a farmer, and he had a orange, uh, uh, whatever, big plant in, in the west, east part of Iraq, and he gave us every year a big sack of oranges and so on. When I looked at the chest x-ray, it was the second rib we removed, not the first rib. So I, I had a prejudice against it until... Ali Aziza convinced me it's it's really there is science behind it. Yeah. Well, we also have a ligament ligament release today on the patient who previously had a laparoscopic attempt and um, she did not have a release. So, and she has very classic presentation of mom. Very good, Navid. How did you do it, Navid? Uh, I'm going to do a trans abdominal um, and uh, from midline, just as a supraceliac exposure and release the. Um, the how old is the How old is the patient? She's 40, 
Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Very good, guys. Well, thanks for for having me, and uh, it's always nice to see you this early morning. And uh, let me know if we can help with anything.